Welcome to Digital Church from the East Solenton Downs Methodist Circuit. It's really good that you've joined us for this service, which is for the second Sunday in Advent. We do like to hear from you, and ways to be in touch will be on the screen at the end of the service, or you can put comments in the boxes below on the video. Let's begin as we come to worship, remembering God's presence with us, his reign over all things. Praise the name of the Lord. Ascribe greatness to our God. The Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and shout for joy, giving God the glory. And let's do that in song. We're going to sing, Hail to the Lord's anointed, great David's greater son.
continue in worship in prayers of praise and of confession. Our praise today comes from Psalm 72. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel. He alone does wonderful things. All kings will bow down before him. All nations will serve him. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel. He alone does wonderful things. He rescues the poor who call to him and those who are needy and neglected. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel. He alone does wonderful things. He has pity on the weak and poor. He saves the lives of those in need. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel. He alone does wonderful things. He rescues them from oppression and violence. Their lives are precious to him. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel. He alone does wonderful things. Praise his glorious name forever. May his glory fill the whole world. Amen. Amen. When the Lord comes, he will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Therefore, in the light of Christ, let us confess our sins. God of humility, we are sorry for times when we behave as if life was all about us, when we show off all we do and hide all that we neglect, when we put others down instead of building them up, when we dwell on what others have done wrong with hardly a thought for our mistakes. Forgive us, we pray, and grant us the will to change and the courage to live out our calling with faithfulness and courage, always pointing to your Son, Jesus, in whom we trust and in whose name we pray. Amen. Loving God, you promise us healing when we turn away from the things that harm us. You promise us a welcome when we leave behind the things that separate us from you. You promise us forgiveness when we find the courage to name our sins. For you are full of love and long to see us whole, living life to the full, generously and compassionately. Amen. God of urgency and truth, at this darkest time of year, we thank you for your light shown in Scripture, shown in those who seek not their own glory, but who point to you, shown in the ways you bless us in the ordinariness of our lives and in the big moments. You are the light that no darkness can overcome, and we thank you for inviting us to share your flame of love. Amen. As we think in this season of the coming of the Lord, we sing again, hark the glad sound, the Saviour comes, the Saviour promised long.
Almighty God, as your kingdom dawns, turn us from the darkness of sin to the light of holiness, that we may be ready to meet you in our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Our reading today is from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 11, the first ten verses. A shoot shall come out from the stock of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him and his dwelling shall be glorious. The message of the Advent season, and um, perhaps particularly last week with Advent Sunday, is usually one of waiting and being ready. It's about watching for an event that we have no idea when it will happen. It's about waiting actively, preparing, going about daily life in such a way that if and when the Lord should come, we will be found going about life in the ways that are in accord with the kingdom that he comes to establish on earth as in heaven. But this looking forward to his coming is not just about us and Christian people for the past 2,000 years and the next unknown number of years, days or minutes. This looking forward to his coming was being proclaimed centuries before Jesus came. Matthew introduces his account of Jesus' ministry with John the Baptist looking forward to the one who is to come. John told the people they should prepare, they should make his route straightforward, and he told them to look for the signs of the times that show his coming is imminent. And John quoted from Isaiah, not the bit that I read just now, but Isaiah chapter 40. Someone is shouting in the desert, Prepare a road for the Lord, make a straight path for him to travel. The prophets had been speaking of God's coming among his people for centuries. Not only had they been saying it would happen, but they had been speaking about what it would look like, what the signs are of his coming, the nature of the kingdom he will come to establish. And then Jesus came. And we might think, that's it. He's come. This is the one who was looked forward to. Now the kingdom is established and it's all done and dusted. That is to understand time in the way the prophets understood it. There is this age, and then at the end of this age, there comes the new age of the kingdom, when God's reign is established on earth as in heaven. The prophets point towards this coming and this kingdom and John the Baptist announces that it has come in Jesus. But Jesus taught that the kingdom is both now and not yet. 
Yes, he is the one the prophets spoke about. Yes, he does come to bring the kingdom. Yes, he is all about peace and unity and judgment and mercy and grace and well-being. And no, it's not finally established. No, it's not all done and dusted. We do still need to hear the voices of the prophets and be ready and waiting and participating in the coming of the kingdom. So I read from Isaiah, looking forward to the coming of the anointed one. The one who will rule in the way that King David's rule had been idealised. The one who will take that rule to the next level, which is almost unimaginable. Isaiah's description of the kingdom to be ruled over by the one anointed by the Spirit of the Lord starts with good human aspiration. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. Or in another translation, he will rule his people with justice and integrity. The ruler's justice will be shown in the punishment of evil. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. All that sounds just what we would want, what we'd look forward to, what we long for, what we might think would be within human grasp if only people would get away from their selfishness and their pursuit of money, power, image, status and staff at the expense of others. But then there's the unimaginable, except that the prophet has imagined it or caught a vision of something beyond human attainment, which speaks of the entire creation being at peace. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. It gives us a model for how prophecy works and the difference between prophecy and telling the future. Jesus makes it clear that it is telling the future if there is an element of knowing or calculating when something is to take place. He says that his return, or what the prophets call the day of the Lord, is not given a date. It's not like Christmas, that's always the 25th of December. It's not even given an estimated date, like a birth. Jesus, like the prophets, spoke of what it would be like, even as he also spoke of prophecy being fulfilled in him. So that gives us two time frames in which prophecy is fulfilled. Jesus' time and what we might call his second coming or the end times or the new creation or what the prophets often termed the day of the Lord. Reading the prophets in Advent reminds us whose birth it is we're going to celebrate at Christmas. He's the anointed one because, as Isaiah put it, the spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And reading the prophets in Advent also reminds us to look forward to that day when the rule of the one anointed by the Spirit of the Lord will be known and effective on earth in the same way that it is in heaven. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's two time frames in which the prophet's words are fulfilled. And I want to add two more. Firstly, very briefly, much prophecy 
was also spoken into and fulfilled in the prophet's near future. So the passage that I read from Isaiah was probably intended to speak to his own time about the coming of a new ruler and given a vision for an idol that if that ruler would rule in God's ways, it would be like that. But more importantly, the other time frame in which the prophet's words are spoken and fulfilled is our own time. We read these things in Advent because they tie in with Jesus' birth. But it doesn't mean that his return will be on the 25th of December, whether this year or any other. What it does mean is that when we see rulers judging fairly and defending the rights of the weak, helpless and vulnerable, when we see justice and integrity in our leaders, then we know that his kingdom is both now and not yet. When we act justly, love mercy and walk humbly with God, to quote the prophet Micah, when we follow in God's ways in our own walks of life and our own relationships, when we overcome divisions between peoples and work for peace, when we turn from all that leads us in the ways of money, power, image, status and staff for its own sake, and live as God's people as though this were God's kingdom. Then the vision of that kingdom comes a little closer to being established on earth in the same way as it is in heaven. Amen. A hymn which ties some of that in together is long ago prophets knew Christ would come, born a Jew. We we'll sing that now. So we come to prayers of intercession. Let us pray. 
God, who speaks and comes among your people, as the prophets foretold the coming of Christ and the Baptist declared his presence, empower your church to make him known at this present time. Guide us with your wisdom and understanding of your word, that we may speak your words and Christ may be present in us and through us. God of wisdom, enlighten the people of this world with repentance for past wrong and a new resolve for the ways of your kingdom of grace, mercy, peace, justice and compassion. Guide all in positions of power, influence and authority and fulfil in our time your promise of peace and reconciliation. God of compassion and mercy, we pray for all who need you today, the poor and the rich, the old and the young, the sick and the healthy, the living and the dying. We keep a few moments quiet to pray for any, especially on our own hearts and minds. If there are people or places or situations you'd like us to pray for, do put the name in the comment or other ways to be in touch will be on the screen at the end of the service. May all those we've thought of or mentioned and those who care for them know your presence your compassion and your healing touch. Give them courage, patience and hope. We draw our prayers together in the prayer for the coming of the kingdom as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our final hymn speaks of how the Christ encompasses all of time, the Alpha and the Omega, and uh, speaks of him as the one that the prophets saw, seers in old time. We sing of the Father's love begotten.
And finally, we ask God's blessing on us. May God the Father, judge all merciful, make us worthy of a place in his kingdom. May God the Son, coming among us in power, reveal in our midst the promise of his glory. May God the Holy Spirit make us steadfast in faith, joyful in hope, and constant in love. And the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us and those we love and all for whom we pray, today and always. Amen. We go into the world to walk in God's light, to rejoice in God's love, and to reflect God's glory. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this service. We hope you've enjoyed it and taking part. And ways of being in touch are on the screen now.